what is your outfit supposed to uh, be? Do you uh, don't want so me asking. This is a, so the, it's a little misleading. Uh, the tunic is actually um, probably about 60s, 70s era Soviet Union, but the boards here are actually a World War I era, um, pre-Soviet Russian military. And uh, I just thought they made a good combo. <laughs> yeah, it looks like a legit uniform, dude. Yeah, it definitely is. And I have the uh, the accurate boards for the uh, the period on their way, but everything I order is from east europe and it always takes a million years to get here <laughs> you, have, you have to dry clean it or oh yeah of course <laughs> look at you styling right now <laughs> dressing like you're from the 1920s and the 2020s <laughs> exactly that's the plan <laughs> i love that and i know i know you're a history buff so i think that's gonna be kind of mm-hmm. to go into that but oh yeah um all right what have you introduced yourself then because this is going to be a fun fun episode i'm justice page i am a cinematographer gaffer and amateur historian amateur historian <laughs> <laughs> i try not to say professional historian because i don't have a good degree to back up anything i say but i could probably still run circles around a lot of people <laughs> did, did you study history then in school or did you go to school uh no not for history so i've always just been in love with it I think it's, uh, I was really young and I'm trying to remember what exactly got me into it. There was like a, and this actually, this is funny. It actually does tie back into movies. Um, the first movie I remember being like obsessed with that I would watch like on end, repeat, repeat was actually this Turner classic movie I found one day when I was like nine, um, called Sahara, which is a Zoltan Korda film starring Humphrey Bogart, um, from world war two. I think it was made in like 1943. Um, and I just, I don't know why I ended up recording it on TCM on TiVo when I was like nine and, uh, I watched it seriously, I think every day for two weeks straight until the TiVo deleted it. Um, and I think that was sort of a big, uh, Kickstarter in my love of both movies and history. And so not long after that, my grandpa started buying me books about world war two when I was like 11 or 12, I tried writing my own book about world war two. Um, and then as I got older, that love of, of that time period kept growing to other time periods and other specific things until it was all encompassing. <laughs> That's so cool. I've never seen that movie. Um, I believe it's on HBO max with their TCM. I think so. And I think you can get it on Amazon prime, but I, I honestly, it was, uh, it wasn't like a huge blockbuster hit or anything. It was, Again, it was on TCM. It wasn't, like, you know, it wasn't like they were playing every, what was what was the most happening thing of the time. You know, they would It wasn't Casablanca, but I was. I again, I cannot even remember for the life of me how I ended up watching it or what, but I did, and it's just a gem of a movie. <laughs> it's just one of those spontaneous moments. Yeah, it's just. It's almost like you know, it's like the the David Ayer movie uh, Fury. You know, it's basically about like a, a tank crew. Um, in North Africa in World War II and they're like going through all this um, shenanigans as World War II movies made in the 40s always entailed. So <laughs> That's cool. I um, Like just the name itself kind of reminds me of is it Lawrence of Arabia. Mm-hmm. Another great movie. That's in my top 10 for sure. Oh, really? I, I think I watched <laughs> that like once or twice in my life, but uh, <laughs> I'm, trying, trying, I'm trying to go through all the old movies on the TCM. To uh yeah yeah I, I I found a list on Letterboxd that somebody put out that it's like chron- chronological order of all the movies that HBO Max has, and <laughs> so I'm trying to watch them all in chronological order, <laughs> just to like you know have like a little film history shenanigans. Wow. Yeah, but, that's impressive. More power yeah. to do yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, film film history actually was my least favorite class when I went to school. I got like a yeah. C in that, so. I don't know, I'm kind of forcing myself to go back and restudy it. <laughs> so we're know, stuck in pandemic. Right. There's no better time than now. I probably yeah, should no. honestly do the same thing. Cause you know, I went to, I went to East Hollywood, which was a film high school, you know, and we had, uh, you know, film history classes. I never took a film history class. I, that was actually, I don't know how it's a mandatory class and somehow I never had to take it. Um, <laughs> so I managed to kind of skirt through and never taking a film history class. I took an international cinema class my sin- my senior year, and it was probably the favorite, my most favorite class I've ever taken, but I never actually took film history. So there's a lot of 
like famous movies that you know cinephiles always seem to discuss about very casually like we've all seen them that i that i completely missed out on i never took a that film history class <laughs> you know what actually so like in my classes we didn't touch on a lot of the, like the mainstream cinephile movies so there's mm-hmm. a lot that i still haven't even seen which is <laughs> okay. kind of, it's, kind of, it's kind of a weird <laughs> that makes me feel better <laughs> yeah um dude i just i think like pre cinema or so films from pre-1952 was like my worst favorite class or my worst class and my worst favorite um <laughs> like it was it was just boring and like the way they graded that class like made it like not wanting to go to you know right and it was like a lot of silent films and so like it was either you're snoozing or you're working on other homework in an auditorium for four hours and yeah and i've always struggled with those still too even if i'm honest today sometimes <laughs> yeah no they're 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 a lot like it's just like you have to be in the mood you know where you uh, really do <laughs> i mean films after 1952 which is like what you know cinema is now mm-hmm. and it's taken like a lot of uh steps from that uh, yeah i learned a lot more from that class than i did from the pre class so it was for the pre-52 class yeah yeah <laughs> yeah well i mean it's it's easier for us to relate to i mean it's a it's a world we can feel like we can reach out and and participate in more when we watch them just because you know with better sound technology and cinematography really taking itself into like an actual art form and you know you have the addition of high quality color and you know this this scope you know and we had like the the face the two point whatever by one friggin' mile long <laughs> widescreen you know and those are those to us feel a little more tangible. We can almost reach out and touch that world. I think more than when we talk about these films from these older eras. Yeah. I, uh, yeah, no, I totally agree. Um, what year did you graduate then from East Hollywood? I I graduated in May of 2013. So it's been seven years now. (laughs) Lord. (laughs) Okay. So we're, we're the same graduating class then. Um, I almost actually went there. That's why I'm, that's why I was asking. (laughs) <laughs> um i almost went there i almost shadowed somebody there who, who also oh. went there i think do you know mike nelson uh-huh yeah I, I i met him at lagoon and i almost shadowed him and uh <laughs> to go to that school but uh-huh plans fell through <laughs> yeah man you, you would have been uh graduate buddies <laughs> yeah <sighs> Dude. um that's funny and so uh so what's let's go into a little bit like what you do now uh you, you're a cinematographer mostly or okay. solely or do you have other stuff yeah. besides yeah that? so so i do um i'm primarily a cinematographer i think if you look at if you look at my my credit resume um i have 31 i think cinematography credits and i think I think the next closest number, I think, is six gaffing credits. So I, <laughs> it's by and large, I think uh, I do cinematography, but I've gotten more into gaffing the past uh, two years, and I also love doing that. Um, but yeah, I mean, I also, I've lived a lot um, kind of in between as well, working in the corporate world. That's where I kind of got my bearings after high school, um, was working in the corporate world. Because after high school, I still wasn't really sure what I wanted to do. I just kind of wanted to work in video. Um, and so I kind of got some odd and end jobs here and there, did some in-house video stuff as an editor and like a backup cameraman and progressively moved up to better editing jobs and then eventually to better uh, actually operating jobs. Um, and yeah, now I actually, uh, I have a corporate video job now um, where I am all of the, uh, the video photo control, <laughs> which was a, a nice step up because I think for all the years that I was doing it, I was, uh, I was playing a second fiddle, I guess, almost to uh, somebody else in the department. Um, but yeah, they really took a chance on me because I told them my background wasn't in photography. It was in cinematography. Um, and they're like, well, as long as you're willing to learn. Um, and I'm glad they did because I think my photography um, has definitely grown leaps and bounds um, in the almost year I've had this job. And I think it's really translated into my cinematography. Um, and, you know, people always would talk about it. They're like, you know, studying, um, studying photography will make you a better cinematographer. And I was like, yeah, I mean, I guess I can see how that would be the case, but I don't know if that's necessary. Um, but I, I, yeah, I'm, I'm glad I did. Um, I think there's so many, um, so many opportunities for us, especially as, creative camera people to um, enhance ourselves um, in all of these ways that we don't necessarily expect, you know, and in avenues that aren't necessarily forthcoming the way we, you know, 
think we understand how we learn and the kind of things that we need to do our job better. Um, so yeah, uh, I think, I think photography has become a super valuable skill. Knowing it, I think has really made me a better cinematographer. So yeah. if you're one of those people out there who's uh, wondering if it'll make you any better to study it, I think you should probably, uh, just go ahead and start. Yeah. Um, because like, I, so I don't study cinematography at all. And I think I've, mm-hmm. only, I, I've, I was a cinematographer for one project and like, I'm like, Hmm. Probably not my thing. Like if I'm not the director, it's like mm, not my thing. Right. Right. Um, <laughs> whereas if I'm doing it myself and like creating it like at home during quarantine, that's like, a whole different story. Right. But like, yeah, to be hired on as a cinematographer is not my <laughs> strongest suit to say the least, Good. but it's my uh, thing. So send yeah. it my way. <laughs> but, uh, I do dabble in photography and I noticed that there is a lot of similarities, you know, like mm. ISO. Mm. And the one thing I kept forgetting though is, with photography, you could boost the shutter speed. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah. You don't uh, want to do that. Do that in, yeah. <laughs> and I'm like, Oh, I have to keep switching back and forth. And so it's like a little bit mm-hmm. of, uh, balancing out, but, um, from the photos yeah. I've seen and from your video work, I think you've done an incredible job and Thank you. I look forward to working with you. Soon. <laughs> like seriously, yes. you, you've been on my like watch list. <laughs> well, I don't know what it is. And you know, this is a shout out to all the people that watch this. And if you're ending up being one of those people, but I, I don't know if it's something about me, but I always, I'm not, I don't necessarily get told I'm unapproachable, but something about the quality of my work has always put people off and that they think I'm, I'm uh, above their ability to come approach me. (laughs) And I've gotten this so many times people are like, yeah, I just thought you were like, not like I was giving off this attitude of I'm too good for you, but like they would look at my work and they would look at, my sort of seeming introvertedness and it'd be like, Oh, I don't know. Is he approachable? Can I, can I come to him about projects? Is, is it even worth like trying to discuss something with him? And I'm like, where did this come from? Like, I don't I feel like all people got to do is talk to me and to know that I'm, I'm not a scary guy. I'm not, I'm not an unapproachable guy. Yeah. Um, and I, I just, yeah, I get that. I get that a lot. And I, so I try really hard to not be <laughs> um, somebody terrifying um, because I, I don't know. I, I think, you know, it's funny because I, I listen to a lot of podcasts and, you know, I, I, I try to keep in the know and there's a lot of, you know, really big working cinematographers, people that shoot hundred million dollar movies. And those cinematographers themselves talk about like, you know, I'm not above free work. Like I, <laughs> they're like, it's almost necessary. It never goes away in your career. There are always, there are always things worth, you know, lending your ear to just to see if it's worth your time. And they're, you know, you never want to push potentially the next greatest thing away because you're supposed to be too good for something. And I, I try to consider myself as somebody who's not too good necessarily for anything. Um, so to all you people out there, I'm not, I'm not that scary. I hope. <laughs> oh, you're like a teddy bear. <laughs> I, I know I'm probably the least threatening person I know. And I feel like anybody that really knows me would, would probably vouch. Well, I would hope would vouch for that. <laughs> well, I, th- I think a lot of it probably has to do with, like, like you said, the quality of your work, seeing that and being like, oh, as like somebody first starting, you know, like, would they know, like, would they like be on the same level as you or like, because uh, there's a weird, there's a weird mindset where directors have to be the knowledgeable ones, right? Or producers <sighs> have to be the knowledgeable ones. And it's like, <laughs> it's really fucking weird. Or it's, it's like, they it's can't be like, of it. yeah. And it's like, it's like, I don't think people realize that like the director and the cinematographer work hand in hand and like. Absolutely cinematographer dude like will know a lot more with the camera stuff than the most most directors and i mean there are a lot of directors out there who who do know it except but like, james cameron <laughs> that guy could do every single person's job on set better than they do yeah <laughs> i think he's uh covered every position almost right <laughs> i think he has by this point my guy <laughs> dude um now here's the thing though so what, what, what would you say your style is as a cinematographer? Every cinematographer has their style, right? What, what, what do you think differentiates oh, you from others? Well, I mean, besides, besides all of this, I mean, <laughs> do, you, do you dress that way on set? Oh man, boy, do I. <laughs> Dude, that's there is, great. There is something to be said about feeling your most comfortable and feeling, um, feeling confident. You know, and honestly, this is a large part of that for me. I mean, they, 
this is part of my set attire almost. I don't know necessarily this one specifically. This one's a little formal. I have a lot of other ones, but, um, <laughs> but it's more about, you know, when I'm on set, I want to be confident. I want to, that's not necessarily that I need to project that I'm in charge, but I do need to be in charge. And a part of that is feeling that and, and, you know, showing up and people being like, all right, whatever that guy's about to say and do, I trust in that. Like it's just, <laughs> there's a part of that, that this gives, but um yeah, it, it, it's, it's part of a, a, a whole thing that I do for sure. Um, <laughs> it's, you know, and it's funny because as we were talking about with the, the whole director DP thing, I, I think I get that so much, um, you know, because I, I do a lot of mentorship work, um, you know, because for me, the education is a huge part of this because I think for so long, especially when I was starting, um, you know, my education was so basic, you know, like East Hollywood High School has gone miles um, since I went there. And I'll be honest, I've helped a little bit with that. I've helped them uh, with their curriculums and stuff, which I'm very happy to do. But when I went there, I think we had, we had an editing class. And I think that was the closest we got to like a specialty class for like specialists. And they were otherwise like generic, you know, here's a class where you watch movies or, you know, here's, <laughs> here's generic production one, two, three. Um, but, you know, now they have like cinematography classes, specific lighting classes, you know, like sound design classes, stuff like that. Um, so when I went there, I was just already general. So I didn't really know what I wanted when I walked out of high school. Um, and so a big part of that for me was like finding it. But I was so scared because there seemed to be this whole sort of aura around, you know, not being able to be um, anything but full knowledge. You know, <laughs> like there, there's like this fear of like, you should know everything already. Like, I know you're. 18 and you just walked out of high school well why don't you know everything and I was so terrified like petrified of that for so long that I kind of held myself back for years um, by not asking questions by not um, seeing um, knowledge democratically um, and you know I've always tried to kind of help rectify that um, by being an active mentor uh, and I and I've found especially that there is is still very much this this belief in people that you know they still need to know it all right when they begin. And, you know, and I work with, I've worked with several new directors and they, you know, they are definitely no exclusion from this. You know, a lot of directors I meet and work with and they're, you know, they're like, well, what is, how does this work? <laughs> you know, for them, it's still sort of new. Um, and I think the biggest mistake I see them make is that they do have to have those answers, right? They think they're supposed to come to me and tell me, all right, put a light here put the camera here, put this lens on. All right. And we're good. Make it look pretty, which is my least favorite saying in the world. If I could make it look pretty. Shirt, <laughs> if I, as a cinematographer, if I could pick something that I detest the most is make it look pretty. Such a reductionist view of what cinematography is, but, but you know, and, and for some people I can't fault them just because they don't have the experience level to know, right? You go into it when you're early and nobody told you at the beginning, this is how a director and DP works. This is what you work together on. This is what, you know, there's the different ways you can work with your director of photography. You know, this is what you want in the director of photography. You know, these are the things that they're expected to know and some of the things that you might want to bring to the table but aren't, you know, obligated to. Um, and it's just, it's crazy. Um, when you kind of give them that space to not know everything, it's almost like you, you're staring at a person and when they have that realization, you can just see all of that stress melt off of them. <laughs> like when I'm sitting there across from them at like a Denny's or something and we're talking about their project and I've got it through them, like, no, it's okay. You, you don't have to know this. That's what I'm here for. You can just see them kind of like, Whoa. Oh, thank God. Because <laughs> nobody's told them that before. Nobody's told them you don't have to know all of that. Like, that's that's why you have a crew. And the crew's job isn't to stand there idly around you going, hey, Mr. Director, what, what do you want me to do? Uh, go go, uh, go, boom over there. And uh, you, go put, you know, this shade of blush on her cheeks. And, <laughs> and you know, can you, uh, hey, can you move that lamp 10 feet to the left? And, hey, Mr. Cameraman, can you put the camera 10 feet over here? They're like, that's not what a director does. And that's not what they're expected to do, you know? Um, and so I, I've always, from my own experience, from how many years I held myself back by not being open about not knowing things and feeling that pressure to know those things, once I realized that pressure only existed right here, that I was doing that to myself, suddenly that melted away and then learning was exciting again. Like diving into all this stuff was exciting. And that's when I think I really became a cinematographer 
uh, because I was a cinematographer for a while. <laughs> I think the first movie I shot was August of 2014. So it's been about six years now. Um, and it wasn't until like early spring of 2017 that I like really actually realized I wanted to be a cinematographer. So there was a good three years <laughs> that I had been shooting movies and had never thought of myself as a cinematographer or thought much about cinematography in general. <laughs> I was just a guy with a camera. Um, and then I just kind of had this epiphany of like the world of something more because I had somebody who made me feel like it was okay to not know things. And then it piked my interest in it. And then suddenly I stared at cinematography and I was like, oh my gosh, this is way cool. I want to learn everything about this. I am fascinated by this. And so I did. I just started getting in there and I spent months and I just blew through like seven different books and I was listening to podcasts and I had all these YouTube channels that I was subscribed to. And, you know, I was out there working and shooting things at the same time. And like, it was just amazing. Like when I was just able to tell myself like, hey, I don't have the answers, but I want those answers. I'm going to go get those answers so I can have skills that are useful to other people whose jobs are not to know those things. Yeah. Uh, ex like what was your first experience like though? Was it intimidating? <laughs> are we talking my first, first experience? Like as like, a cinematographer or just like, your like first, the first film? thing you shot in like 20, 2014, you said, right? Yes. Yeah, is that yeah. something you like to show people or is that? <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, I, I don't even, I don't think I have a copy of it. I have frames from it. Like I have um, these frame grabs, but I don't have a copy of the file. And I don't know if anybody does. I haven't bothered asking, but um, <laughs> that was, that was a relate. That was a, that movie actually ended my two and a half year relationship for one. And it like, it <laughs> threw my life into this whole like crazy spiral over the next several months, just cause I, yeah, we, none of us knew what we were getting ourselves into. And it ended up being like, a huge time commitment and like 16 hours a day, like up in Ogden and we lived in like the Valley. And again, this was like my first rodeo. This was my first credit as a cinematographer. And I didn't know what was, what I was supposed to be doing. What, I mean, I was basically just running around. They'd be like, go here. And I'd be like, okay, let's do it. And it was, it was maddening. It was so crazy. Um, it was, <laughs> I always say it's one of the worst experiences of my life that I remember so fondly. <laughs> it was miserable beyond all hell. But now I think back on it like, man, I am so glad that was my first experience <laughs> because it only got better. <laughs> yeah. I always think back on like first experiences just in general, like how chaotic they are and like oh, how yeah. nobody knows what the hell they're doing. Like, no, all, right. It was so bad. <laughs> Dude, and like, I guess it kind of goes along the philosophy though, where, um, just like filmmakers in general are always like, you know, just go out there and shoot, like learn. And that's basically the learning process is like, this is not how you do it. <laughs> right. Yeah. That's a huge part of it. And it was, it was very much because again, at the time it wasn't for about another three years before I really dove into what cinematography really is, the science and the art of it, the intent behind it. And so at that time I, you know, I couldn't have told you how dynamic range and ISO correlated. I wouldn't have, had any two shits to give about Kelvin or, you know, I, I wouldn't have been able to tell you what, uh, what shutter angle, you know, like back in, back in those days, I, that was stuff that was still foreign to me. I had like, I had my own original black magic pocket, the, the little teeny guy from forever ago. And that was, I just, I just shot on that, you know? Um, and it was, it was just a whole slew of things I had never had to think about before. Um, and continued to not think about in my, trauma for like three years because <laughs> it was terrifying um and it really was um but as i said for me it was great and i think everybody needs an experience like that because i think if you survive your first experience being your worst experience you find that it's so much better from there on out but not only that the fact that you survived that one if you keep making movies after you're gonna keep making movies forever <laughs> yeah dude like i, I kind of consider movies like memory lane <laughs> <laughs> They're so like the process of filmmaking and being on set for long hours and like each set's different. So there's like all these different memories and associations, you know? Oh yeah. And like the more you do, like the more fun you have and they're like, dude, we pulled them all nighter for that. And like, mm -hmm. fantastic, you know, uh -huh. <laughs> you kind of find your film, your film family in a sense. And 
I think having that as a backup to resort to for support and just for like, you know, r- relatability in some sense, because not everybody understands film. <laughs> no, I find that it's a hardly understood industry yeah. at all. Yeah. Well, Cause I guess I mean, if you go to like, uh, like say Thanksgiving, like a family <laughs> Thanksgiving and they're like, Oh, what do you do? And like you get nerdy about what you do and they're going to be like, Right. I always get nervous about it and I try to find a way to explain it without being honest about it. <laughs> like, I don't know. I've, I try to tell people like I'm a cinematographer because odds are they're going to go, what? Uh, but then at, at that point I'm like, well, how much do I divulge here? Like how much time do they got? Do they really care? Like how invested are they in actually hearing what I'm about to go into? Cause I will go into it. Like, <laughs> <laughs> Oh, uh, and it's hard. It is hard to explain to people. It really is such a unique industry and the things you do and the connections you make, like they are highly unique. And, and I've worked in a lot of fields in my life. And most of the people that work in film come from so many different backgrounds and so yeah. many different other professions that it, it does. We all have this sort of relatability with each other, this sort of like, a, you know, we're not, we're not on a, out on a battlefield watching each other die, you know, but it almost feels like we're, uh, we're part of like a, a shared veterancy almost like it's, yeah. we've survived some stuff. Like, <laughs> um, you know, my favorite podcast out there, the cinematography podcast, they, uh, they have a segment called war stories where all of the cinematographers they bring on, just tell like a story of something they worked on. That's really stuck with them. something they remember something that could have ended terribly or disastrously, or sometimes it was just something wild and unexpected, you know, but I feel like it's such an apt name because, you know, we're not, we're not soldiers and we're not serving in a war, not by any means. But I think there is something kind of about how you make a movie that almost provides that same kind of camaraderie that's hard to articulate outside of film. You know, like how do you, I mean, like for instance, two of the biggest projects I worked on last year, I was a first AC on a feature shooting in Moab. Um, We were shooting, well, it was an hour outside of Moab in the middle of nowhere. Like you had to drive over a mountain. It was an hour to get to where we were over a mountain. Um, and we, it was just madness, man. We were on the desert for like two weeks. We'd have to take ATV. We was like a 40 person crew. We'd have to take ATVs like half a mile up to this Canyon every day with all the equipment and then climb on foot a half mile with all of the gear to the base camp that was at the base of where we were shooting every day in the middle of these canyons, you know? And then by the, by like the last week, it started raining a whole bunch. We had like two days that were almost completely, um, scrapped because it just started raining like nothing like i'd never seen rain like that and it was starting to flood and we had to like put all the equipment in like tents and like cover everything in tarps because there were like rivers forming through the camp oh man and then we were stranded for a while because it's all dirt and then when you get dirt wet it's just mud so we actually couldn't leave because the way back was now just gonna be mud um but you know how do you how do you talk somebody through these experiences? Cause I, I just gave a very general view of them, but like, how do you talk about what it is to be there with those people in that moment and like what you were building towards and why it mattered to you so much that you were willing to do that? Like that you were willing to stand in that rain for four hours till it abated and that it was freezing and it was rivers flooding and you were soaked head to toe and you were trying to keep the equipment safe and clean, you know, and you were basically in the middle of nowhere. You might've even could have died somehow. Like, <laughs> but for you, you're like, yeah, man, this is like, this is just our life. This is what we do. This is just part of like what we show up to do. You know, we're here to shoot a scene of a, a girl, you know, appearing as an apparition through the mist. Of course we're going to risk life and death. Like, <laughs> How do you articulate that to people in a way that they understand if they haven't had these experiences? Yeah, you're, you're like, yeah, well, we almost died and cost, you know, thousands of dollars in damage of equipment. Almost. But we got the shot. We did. <laughs> it was worth and it. And that's what mattered. We made our day somehow. <laughs> uh, what's, what's the thing that you look for in projects then before you say yay or nay to like coming on board? That's a hard thing. I think, I think there are always, there's always two things. And I think one for me is primarily that there is a story there. And I think that's really important, right? Because for some people, they'll say yes to anything. And I kind of get why, but I feel like I'm at a point where I don't necessarily have to. Yeah. You know, like it, it should be a story worth telling, you know, only because the skills I have are only going to be the most useful to you in a story worth telling. Yeah. You know, to be honest, if we can just be frank, if your story's trash, if your story is little substance. If you're just making it for fun and you just kind of wrote something just to write something, 
like the skills I, I have are only going to hold you back because what I expect out of myself in a project and out of planning, you know, and out of execution, you know, is going to be different than what you're looking for in a project like that. But when it's a good story, you know, that instantly creates like this connection of like, all right, we're all going to be on the same page here that this needs to be done in the best way that we can all work. Yeah. Right. And you can read a script and know like, all right, anybody that's going to read this and join this is going to be committed to bringing this story to the screen in its best light possible. You know, and so story is always huge and it's not even necessarily that I always have to resonate with the story. I just have to know the story is good. The second thing I think is a director, you know, because I think, I think the director DP relationship is one of the most misunderstood when you're in the, the earlier part of your career. Um, and so for me, you know, it's so important that I'm finding these directors that are, I don't even want to say coachable because it's not necessarily my job every time to coach them, but that they are open, you know, that they are collaborative. Cause for me, that's really what it comes down to, yeah. you know, like I want people to hire me because they value that I can bring something there. Like I don't want people to hire me to, you know, again, tell me, go put it over here and make it look pretty. Like I'm, that's not what I'm here for, you know, and that I want more out of my career than that. And so for me, a director that is open and collaborative wants to, ask me questions and hear what I think about a scene, you know, and, and is open to me being like, well, actually when I read it, I kind of see it this way or I think about it this way. It's not necessarily that every time I suggest it, they're going to go, that's great. I love that. I think that's right on. Cause uh, sometimes it happens that they're like, actually, no, that's not what I was thinking at all. And you have to be completely okay hearing that and being like, okay, cool. That's not personal. You know, <laughs> just cause they didn't like my idea. It doesn't mean they don't like me. Like I, the people that can't separate the two drive me crazy. But beside the ego note, you know, like it is important for me that I, that I get that. Um, because if I, if I'm going to go to a director and I can tell right away that they're going to be self-conscious, that they're going to be, you know, anxious all the time, that they are prone to get stressed really easily, you know, like, and that they, they're, they're one of the people who are just going to shut down when things get hard. Like, you know, that's, that's a worrying thing for me because, you know, things are going to get hard. It's movies inevitably, like no matter how much we plan, there are so many things that are still going to go wrong. Um, and there's still so many things we have to think on our feet about, um, you know, and so that's so big for me that that collaboration is, is huge. And, you know, and I'm so thankful that I think the last several directors I've worked with have all really been this way. And it's really kind of helps reinforce that for me that that's what I'm looking for, you know, like, the film I'm in the middle of shooting of now, we had our first shooting block a couple of weeks ago. Um, great guy, Stephen Ford. Um, you know, we had all these talks. We had like, he, he, we met like five months before we even started shooting and we went to Olive Garden and like, he brought a copy of the script and we just like went through it. And he was just like, what are your thoughts? What are your ideas? That open collaboration is ultimately what I'm looking for. You yeah. Know? Cause I think, you know, I'm showing up ego free or, you know, at least trying to, none of us are perfect, but, <laughs> but I'm trying to show up ego free. Cause you know, the point is we're trying to tell the best story we can. And that means we have to be open to also discovering what that is, yeah. you know? And so when I'm reading the script and the director says, what do you think? I'm going to actually tell him what I think, you know, for, it does me no service. Be like, sure. Yeah, that's good. I got no problem. Like, let's do it. Like, <laughs> but you know, in the one I was referencing, you know, there were, there was a scene where I was like, I think maybe we should shoot it this way. I was like, because kind of the vibe I'm getting from this character is this. And then the director actually went, no, that's, that's not it at all. He's like, actually what it is, is this. And I was like, Oh, interesting. I was like, I didn't necessarily get that from the scripts, but now that you explain it, I understand that. And I was like, and then what, what, what if we did it this way then, if that's what we're trying to convey? And he was like, that's brilliant. I'd never thought about it that way. I love that. Let's do that. You know, and that's how it should be. Like, he should be comfortable saying, here's why I don't think that idea works. And he should also be comfortable with saying, I like that, actually. That's really good. Let's make that change. Like, both are okay. It's okay for an idea not to be good. And it's okay for good ideas to be used, right? Like, and that's, that's so important for me when I work with a director is I don't want a director to say, oh, no, you know, whatever. We're, what, what we got is what we're going to get. You know, like, let's not, let's not try to change anything. Yeah. Or, you know, and I don't want somebody who's going to be like, well, you know, I, I don't really need to hear your notes about the script or anything. I'm like, we're just, the script is going to be what it is. I like when there is that openness for them to say, all right, what do you see in this script? You know, what are you liking? What is there anything that's giving you any issues? Like, 
when you were reading this scene, like what was, what were you taking away from it? Like what messages, what about these characters were you taking away? And cause I, I get real deep in that stuff, you know, because it is such a big part of cinematography. Again, in the scene that I was just talking about, you know, I, the character was, was written very, um, almost stereotypically, you could say of what you would expect of this character's job, you know? And I was like, is that intentional? Are we trying to show him that way? And again, it came back. It was like, no, that's a front. He's trying to be this thing. But in reality, he's really struggling with actually being that, you know, he's actually like a lower level person in this company, you know, like he's not, he's not actually a hot shot. And I was like, well, then what if we can make that, you know, like in a shot, like we start really close and it looks like he has a really nice office and everything. And then by the time we get to the end of the scene and we're cutting back between this, we see that he's sitting in a very tiny office. You know, it's a throwaway office, not even a real office. And, you know, we make him really small in the frame, you know, and we kind of like use the lighting to kind of show kind of this defeatedness and this mutedness in the color. So that by the end, you actually get a sense of who he really is, which is a contrast to how he's portraying himself, right? Like, and those are things in cinematography that can enhance your story. Like that's, that's what we're here for. That's what we're trying to help you do. We're trying to find those things like elevate it use the visuals to either enhance what you're trying to say or show that what you're saying isn't what's actually happening you know and so i love that i love that and i really do go into the nitty-gritty with that with directors and so that is something i look for that's fun dude that pa- that passion i think is something that should always be looked for in a project uh-oh. no uh-oh no don't do it Bring your own back. Oh, it's moving. Okay. <laughs> okay. Now I see you and hear you. <laughs> oh, Lordy. Okay. Um, that, I think the passion that you have, though, is something that directors should look for and some target for as well, you know? Because um, I, I think I've been on some projects where we've always just tried to reach out to somebody just to shoot it without mm-hmm. having any connection, right? And I, I, I don't know. Those aren't as enjoyable as, like, everybody being on the same page and you're like, we're here to make some fucking art, you know? Right. Well, there's a, that's the thing about like the director DP relationship. The DP is basically supposed to be your guardian of the integrity of your story, right? Like that, that's a big part of that job. And you want yeah. somebody who cares about the story, who wants to see it be its best and who's going to stand up for you, the director too, you know, like there are people above the director sometimes, you know, especially when you get on things that are like paid and distributed and stuff. And you want somebody like a DP who's going to stand with you and stand with your vision and have your back, you know, like that is what we do. We are there for you on set to maintain the integrity of your vision and help you tell your best story. And we are there to help you maintain that even after offset too. Like you, you want that champion of your story and that's what we are supposed to be as DPs. So, okay. So as a cinematographer, do you pay attention to coloring like, like posts, you know, like with like lights and stuff? Oh yeah. Oh yeah, absolutely. (laughs) I think that part is, and you know, it didn't always used to be this way. And they always talk about like, you know, the old, uh, old guys who shoot on film kind of talk about this is that sometimes you would never get a choice. It would just go off to the lab and it'd be processed how you would hope it's processed, but you would not necessarily know until you watched it. But you know, we have so much of that in the digital world now that we can control. And I think to not control it is to neglect your image, you know, and a part of that is shooting with intent you know, and that's my biggest thing, you know, those three words, people hear me say it a zillion times, shoot with intent, you know, like, and that includes your post-production color process, you know, that includes what color space are we shooting in, how much detail are we trying to preserve, you know, uh, what are we, are we using color theory properly to make sure that we have colors that are working with each other, or if they're not working with each other, that there's a thematic reason, right? That we know how these colors are going to come out in post, that we're making sure the detail is there where it needs to be, you know, all of that. And then getting into the color process and, you know, making those adjustments and saying, okay, this orange is a little too distracting for me. How do we bring it down? Or sometimes it's, how do we change it entirely? Sometimes it's, you get into the edit and you're like, actually all this green that we use, I don't really like. And I think it's really throwing me off and it's having the know-how to say, okay, I know how we can fix that. I know how we can change that. And I know how we can play around with that. And that is important because part of your job as a DP is maintaining the integrity of the image. And if you just take your hands off the wheel when you're done on set, then you're not really maintaining the integrity of the image because you're giving it to somebody else to hope that they maintain whatever your integrity that you think you had was, right? You're basically just sending it off into nomad land and like hoping that it makes it all the way across 
but there are too many horror stories of like even big, you know, DPs shooting huge movies that they go when I, I never really saw the value of, you know, sitting myself in the color suite with a colorist um, in the post process. And then they would see the movie on the screen and they're like, wow, they butchered it. (laughs) Just because, you know, they're going to, if without your guidance or instruction, they're just going to do what they think is best. And oftentimes, you know, the people that actually give it the thumbs up at the very end are just going to go with that because they didn't hear your side of things first and you didn't give yourself the, uh, the integrity to be there to guarantee that. So I think it's huge. I do a lot of my own coloring and I've actually dove way more into it the past couple of months, um, you know, doing actual official training on it um, and studying and reading as I do and, you know, listening to the experts because that for me is how do I continue to find new ways to maintain that integrity once it leaves the set, you know, because I, I, I'm not just going to let it go into no man land and then go to the premiere of the movie and go, what did they do? <laughs> like, yeah. This is not what we had in mind. Like sometimes it's not even what the director had in mind because they just hand it off to an editor and colorist and they just, it's something they're not paying attention to because, you know, a director's got a million other things they got to be thinking about. So that's why it's my job to maintain that because the director shouldn't have to be thinking about that. He's got so many other things on his plate or her plate. Yeah, because um, I think I, I think it was Deacon's podcast. He's talking about how Denny pretty much said, you're going to be part of the editing process yep. <laughs> for this because yes. there's a lot of color. <laughs> yes, he was very he was very adamant that Deacon's be involved in that pipeline, which is what his wife does, James. She's a, she's a big, um, she's really knowledgeable in that whole uh, digital pipeline that the image has to go through to maintain that integrity. And that's kind of what oh, she really? does for him. Ooh. Um, so yeah, she's, she works with making sure that the image, um, you know, that they're getting the image that they want in terms of, you know, making sure it's being displayed properly and that they're getting the dailies and they're seeing them in the proper way so that they know they got what they wanted and, you know, working with the post house. So, you know, she does all of that, which is great. Um, you know, and I think Roger himself said he was glad, you know, he kind of dreaded it at first because it's like a ton of extra work, but he was really glad he did because he realized that if he hadn't done that, that, <laughs> that there would have been so many problems and it would not have been the same film that we all got. Yeah. And he won best cinematography for it. So like, fuck yeah, yeah win win. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, okay. So is there a recent movie then? Like, um, I mean, recent within like the past five years or the cinematography has kind of stuck with you after the viewing? Um, like, is there, is there like a, like one yeah. scene that always comes to mind when you think about cinematography now that kind of influences? I don't know if that makes sense. And we're just talking the last like five years within the last five years. Cause you mentioned, you mentioned Sahara. That's what it was called, right? The yeah, Sahara. Term. And that film's yeah. black and white. That ain't got no color to it. Anymore, oh, but. <laughs> um, so let's, let's uh, talk more recent then. Um, you know, I already talked so much about this and anybody that really knows me knows I've talked about it way too much, but I, you know, I loved 1917 for sure. And I think the cinematography for that movie was so intentional, well, stupid ones, so intentional and in how they executed everything. And, you know, and that to me is like the, the textbook example of what I try to illustrate to people, of what they should be trying to do. Not necessarily that they're going to that scale, but that every movement, every minute, every exact distance had to be planned out. They had to know what they were doing. And it so much showed in the movie that you could actually tell that everything they were doing was intentional. They weren't just showing up on the day like, huh, what do you think? What should we do? Should we maybe go this way? Like, do, but if we went back and they're like, uh, well, that's not really working. Maybe we'll come over here. And then boom, you've wasted like a whole day. You've lost hundreds of thousands of dollars because you walked in and went, I don't know, let's figure it out, I guess. Like, <laughs> that's just not how you do things. You know, there has to be an intent there and that movie required it. And so I, for me, the, the cinematography is a beautiful execution. And I think it's so, it's just, I mean, Deacons is great in himself, just be, you know, he's one of the top men of his craft maybe ever. But that movie to me just, just reeked of intentional choices and they were thematically intentional choices. And they talk about like in the behind the scenes stuff, they would, you know, they would do these rehearsals and in the beginning they would talk like, well, you know, if we're in front of them at this moment, what are we saying? Like compared to, you know, what's the priority? Like in the room where they're in the beginning and they go in the map room with the general in that underground thing. Um, they were like, well, you know, why do we come around and do we see the general's face or do we come around and see their face? Like, and then they would go, no, no, no. Well, actually thinking about it, the people that we only care about focusing on are these two. So we don't need to worry about the camera coming here and then coming back here and then 
coming back through. We hold on this because this is actually the meat of what we're trying to show, you know, and that is all incredibly intentional. And another great one is arrival. I think arrival is another one that probably a lot of people will say, because I think <laughs> arrival is just another, it's like, it's arrival is a cinematography tone poem. Really. It, it's just, it's almost Tarkovsky. And when I watch it, it's, it's like a, it's poetic cinematography in the way that it, it's, it's trying to convey emotions. <laughs> I can't see that. I can't see that. Wow. <laughs> yes. Wow. That was amazing. It almost felt like you set me up for that, but people aren't going to believe me when I say that that was just completely coincidental. <laughs> no. Uh, hold on one second. I just spilled my water. Hold on. Wow. Spill it on the router. <laughs> I couldn't do the router any worse. Is that a plant? Look at that plant. That plant is thriving. Okay, sorry about that. I like, <laughs> totally tipped over my whole water. So you got so excited. <laughs> I, for, well, I thought I finished the water, and it just, turns out I did not finish the water. So nice. Um, no. So for me, like when I think of cinematography, it always goes back to the opening sequence of Arrival, mm. and the way that's shot, and like. Yeah, it's so moody and so emotional and dramatic. And, oh, movie. Oh, my goodness. And, like, I was, that movie actually kind of got me to have an idea of, like, why not put the metadata on a Blu-ray or something? What lens is being used? At, like, what <laughs> ISO, you know, and, like, kind of yeah. help teach people, like, exactly how they achieved a shot. And, but it kind of takes away the magic of it, too. So, yeah. it's like a win-lose. Well, there's... um. That podcast I was talking about, the cinematography podcast, a couple uh -huh. of weeks ago on, I think it was, it might have only been only two or three weeks ago, but they actually interviewed Bradford Young and it was their first, I think, two-parter episode. So Ooh. I think there's one episode where he just talks about Arrival. So <laughs> it might be uh, worth giving it a listen because I think he uh, he talks a lot about the creative process of, of the thought behind how they shot that movie. Yeah. Um, so could, because you, could, a, you could listen to that all day. Well, there's, there's one podcast that he was on. I don't remember what podcast it was. I was just, I typed in his name to see if he was on one randomly yeah. one day. I think it was like a year ago, but he was talking about how he calls the blacks in that movie, the creamy blacks mm -hmm. yeah, or milky are. blacks or something like that. And they are milky. Yeah, for sure. They're not, they're not, um, they're not your standard hard blacks, right? Yeah. They're, he, he brings up the detail in, in the lowest of black. So that the black point probably sits around probably 10 IRE instead of where you would put it around zero to two IRE because it, it gives it kind of this lift. It really, it almost like a, it almost creates this dreamlike texture to the shadows because they almost have this sort of uniformity with even like the midtones and the highlights. Um, yeah, it's really, it's, it's, I mean, he's definitely not the first person to do it, but it was, it was definitely a very intentional creative choice they made. And I, I loved, I, I, I loved it. And I do, I think it was absolutely a cinematography tone poem. And it was an example of like, if you're going to be poetic about your cinematography, like that's how you do it. Because it was so intentional. What they were trying to say and the feelings they were trying to evoke for the payoff at the end were so intentional and how they hit that so hard. And their color choices were very intentional. It was absolutely, yeah, it's, it's fantastic. <laughs> yeah. One of my favorite movie. Dude, I, cr I cried in the five first five minutes of my first viewing, like in the theater. Oh, I was I like, "What? What kind of movie is this? This isn't happy." <laughs> I can't do it now. You know, it's funny because the thing that you always underestimate is when you become a parent. When you get like parent centric stories like that, you can't. Like, I, I just cannot. Like, I, I watch that movie now and I immediately start crying. Same with Interstellar. Like, I I get like ten minutes into the movie and I'm already like, "Oh, can't handle it." Like my dad brain instantly just like those relationships with like children and stuff is like oh shoot Dude, me i cry people, there's people in my work who uh because i work in an office you know to, to pay the bills yeah. but uh they always talk about how they don't like matthew mcconaughey crying in interstellar and i'm like that part didn't wreck you like what? i get wrecked oh that part <laughs> murders me i look like him when i'm watching that scene because i'm just sitting there like <laughs> sobbing like Murph. <laughs> Murph. Oh, it's just heartbreaking i don't know how people don't get so worked up and as i said as a dad now like thinking myself as a dad with a daughter 
like, oh, when I get to that scene, I almost have to turn it off. I'm like, I cannot watch this. This is just like so much. And I feel, I'm just somebody who feels so strongly. And yeah. so those, I watch that and I, I seriously, I don't even exaggerate. Like I do cry. I straight up go right through the tears running down the face, like choking back sobs kind of cry. <laughs> okay. Um, so I guess, so I guess, um, speaking of crying, this is a segue. Okay. <laughs> So one of my, one, something I've always told myself, uh, when I first started going to school for film Mm -hmm. was I would know I made it when I see my parents cry or my loved ones cry watching a piece of mine. Right. Yeah. And I'm like, that's a goal of mine still is to have family members cry. Even if it was intentional to cry, but it's like proudness, you know? Right. To know that I made something that they're proud of even, you know what I mean? Oh yeah. Absolutely. So is there is there a goal of that for you? Like, how do you know I, you've made it? <laughs> I don't know. You know, and honestly, for me, philosophically, I don't know if I ever want to make it. You know, like when I think about it, when I think about you know myself being an eighty year old man, like a, a seventy year old graying, <laughs> balding old cinematographer, like I don't want to feel like I made it when I yeah. hit that point. You know, for me, like when you make it, you stop feeling like you got to put in that same level of effort that you put in when you're 24, you know? And I, I don't ever want to stop feeling that way. I don't ever want to stop being that passionate. And so I, I really don't hope I ever do make it. And the only, the only thing I have for myself really is to know that I've, that I've, you know, made it is that, that, you know, people talk about it in the same regards that I talk about the movies that I love, you know, in the way that, it changes the way that they think about who they are as people, you know, and as a cinematographer, I maybe have less of a hand in that than, you know, maybe a writer or a director or an actor does. Cause those are the people that really do that side of things that we can cognizantly identify. Right. But I know that cinematography is a huge part of that, obviously. And it's why I do it. And so I can only hope that I shoot something that, you know, makes people in some regards look at themselves and, and reflect on who they are as people and who they want to be. Um, and that's all I can really hope for, you know, if you, if you can help an individual be a better version of themselves, then, you know, what, what else is there? Man, that's a fair point. I didn't look at it like that before. No, I mean, it's a great question and, you know, and there's nothing wrong with wanting to make it at all, you know, but I think for myself, I just know who I am as a person. And I know like if I ever actually can feel like I've made it, I'm just not going to be as good at what I do anymore. That's such a humbling response. <laughs> <laughs> I love that response. I really do. Um, okay. And so let's see, because I know you probably have to go wake up your daughter soon. You know, you're totally fine. She's already awake. I can hear her in the other room. Oh, okay. My wife's uh, there. You don't have to worry too much. <laughs> oh, okay. Dude, high five the internet for not giving a shit right now. Like. I know. <laughs> this, this would have been the worst moment, honestly, for it too, because I, I would have had to find a way to muster up all of that. Uh, all of that inspiration again <laughs> dude no okay honestly though like that response like i don't know because it kind of goes back into the craft of like people coming from different backgrounds you know and they're all collectively coming together to make all one piece essentially which mm-hmm. will always have different interpretations depending on who's viewing it yep. like I, for you you love dunkirk because or not dunkirk sorry 1917 because you know the use of the cinematography and how it heightens emotions and Mm-hmm. I, I'm assuming I'm speaking for you. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> uh, for me, that wasn't my favorite movie. It was, I was very critical of it, um, right. but all for different reasons. You know what I mean? And like, I mm-hmm. can appreciate where you're coming from with that. I'm like, Oh yeah. Like, so right. I love hearing different thoughts <laughs> on the process. Absolutely. It is. It's all collaborative. And I think that's what makes filmmaking so special is there are so few industries in this world where the final result is, the result of dozens or hundreds, or even in some of these movies cases, thousands of people's contributions in some form, you know, and that without these individual contributions, it would not be the same quality of work. It would not be the same resonance that it is. And so for me, there is something magical because I can't take ownership of it. And I love that. I can't take ownership of this movie being fantastic. I can't take ownership of somebody having a strong reaction in this movie because we all did that. We all in our own way participated in that. And that is so cool that I can turn to this person who worked on this and say, hey, man, we had a hand in this. Like, 
This was, we were a part of this and being part of something bigger is something I love. I am not the big thing, but being able to participate in creating this big thing with all these other people is just the coolest thing ever. And I love it so much. Like my favorite emotions are walking away knowing that we had something great that we did that day. And it was because all of us in that building, in that room, were there and we were being our best selves and we were showing up and we were thinking critically and we were helping each other. We were laughing while we were doing it, having a good time. And that is, there's nothing like that. There really is not. It's, it's just something beyond like my fondest, some of my fondest memories in life are on film sets by and far. So how, how do you handle self doubt, doubt then? Because surely as an artist, you, you come across, you know, moments <laughs> of that. That's just like inevitable of being an artist. So how do you handle that then being a cinematographer? You know, I, it was, it was much worse earlier in my career for sure. And it, and I only say that not because I don't have self doubt now, um, not because I'm some you know great cinematographer who doesn't mess up, but you know, <laughs> I found that for me, the, the doubt just gets in the way, you know, like if I'm thinking about the doubts, I'm not thinking about the solution. And so when I find myself in that doubt, I just remind myself of that. Like, Am I being constructive? Am I being helpful when I'm being doubtful? No, like being doubtful, being negative, being pessimistic, being anxious, being stressed, like none of those things are helping solve the problem. None of those things are. Like inherently being stressed doesn't make you a better problem solver. Inherently being stressed doesn't invite solutions. Like that, that means finding clarity of self, separating your emotions from yourself in that moment and thinking straight into what an answer is, you know? And so I do get those moments, you know, but those moments largely don't come on set anymore or when I'm in that process with a director because I, it just almost can't, you know, like if I'm doing that, I'm disservicing the story. If I'm sitting there going, Oh man, how are we going to do this? Are they, do they think I'm a fraud? Am I going to be able to pull this off? I've never done this thing before. You know, like what if they think I know this thing, but I don't know. Like if I'm thinking about those things, am I thinking, how am I conveying this character's emotion? Am I thinking, how am I emphasizing the theme of this story throughout the film? Am I thinking, how can we use our lighting in this situation to enhance the tone? No, because I'm thinking about the doubt. I'm thinking about the stress. I'm thinking about the negativity. I'm thinking about the worry and the anxiety. And so I try very hard not to. But when you're by yourself, yes, it absolutely happens, right? But I think then it can because there's no state. If I'm sitting at home by myself in my room, being stressed, being anxious, feeling like a fraud, feeling like I'm not good enough, I'm not affecting anybody else at least, right? (laughs) The only person I'm doing that to is myself. And that's when it's okay. And that's when it's okay for me to evaluate, why do I feel this way? Did I do something? Have I been looking at too much of my own work recently? Do I need to stop (laughs) going back over my stuff over and over again? Do I need to just find something I love? You know, when I get down, I watch... Um, you know, I watched The Great Beauty. The Great Beauty is my favorite movie of all time. I, you know, when I get in that place, I'm like, all right, I just need to sit down and watch this movie. Just because it just really gets me in like this calmness and this headspace and gets me like thinking about like almost existential. You almost like, I, it almost puts me in this headspace of like, well, nothing matters. Life is beautiful, you know? <laughs> it almost just, it just kind of reduces it all down to that. Um, but it used to be super frequent in our early career, you know, because I said there's that pressure of I need to know this thing. But now, as I said, I'm so open about, like, I don't know this. Like, the movie that, I, that I'm in the middle of, the one that I just had our first shooting block for, um, there was a whole day of it on a soundstage with blue screen. And I had never done either of those things before. <laughs> you know? How do you light something to look like it's naturally occurring daytime light inside of a studio? And, you know, it would have been easy for me to go, oh, man, I've never done this. This sounds like a technical challenge that I don't know if I'm qualified for. I don't even know where to begin learning these things. And I did do those things for two seconds when I was by myself. But when it came crunch time, I was like, okay, cool. Here's what I need to learn. I know I can go here and I can find some resources on it. I can ask around. I can practice. I can think about this from a technical standpoint of like, all right. And and, and in an own observation of eyes, you know, because that's really our best our best tool as cinematographers is I can go, oh, well, how am I going to make this look natural? What does it look like? I'm freaking walk outside. <laughs> Make somebody go stand on the sidewalk, stare at their face. What is the light doing? What are the shadows? Are they hard shadows or is there a little bit of softness to them? Are they pure black? You know, are they giving raccoon eyes? Like, is there light bouncing from anywhere else? Like, bouncing off of the road is going to give a darker bounce light than if bouncing off the sidewalk because the sidewalk's really light. You know, is there any weird colors coming from, like, the trees or the grass? Like, what does that all look like? And then thinking about, okay, well, cool. 
I, I can know inherently as a human being who's experienced life and seen things with my eyes, what that can look like. And now I just need to figure out what tools are going to get me that. What lights are going to give me that intensity like the sun does, the color like the sun does? What diffusions are going to shape the light like the sun would if it was a hazy outside? You know, and that to me is like instantly my brain starts running a million gears and I start thinking of solutions, right? Whereas before when I'm going, oh man, how am I going to do this? I don't know how to do this. This is kind of scary. I don't know. Should I tell him that I don't know how to do this? Like, yes, I did tell him I didn't know how to do it, but I told him and I'm going to figure it out. <laughs> but when I was thinking about those things, right, that wasn't me thinking about solutions. And so I try, I think the self-doubt can be so plaguing because you're harming other people. When you're working in film, you're harming other people. When you're doing, right. you know, more of your solo arts, like, you know, like painting or like fine art photography or things like that, right, where it's very self-driven, I almost think you can allow yourself to have those doubts, right? Because you're not, you're not holding anybody else back with them. But when you're in film, as we were talking about, I got a whole crew of people I need to communicate to. I have my gaffer, I have grips, electrics, I have my AC or multiple ACs and a DIT. I have the director, you know, I got to work with the art director. Like if I'm sitting here in my doubts without answers, like I'm hurting those people. I'm hurting those people's ability to do their best work. So I just don't give myself the space to do that when those people's jobs and the quality of their jobs is at stake because that's just not fair to them. That's a very fair response. (laughs) (laughs) You're so driven. I love it. (laughs) You kind of have to be. Yeah, you you have to be. And like, it's kind of like, it's a nice, I don't know, seeing that much positivity and insight into, into your life. It says a lot in the midst of a middle of a pandemic when like, (laughs) yeah, like for me, like, so like I'm very doubtful in my writing, like a lot of Mm. times or even on projects I'm editing. Right. I'm like, Oh God, like, (laughs) or in the podcast, you know, like I'm like always doubting stuff, but like you Mm. said, you have a whole crew behind you. I'm definitely over here by myself. (laughs) When you're by yourself, it's so much harder because there is nobody else at stake in that moment. You can sit in that and, and I think that it, that makes it harder in a sense because you can, right? You can sit in that and it can hold you back. Yeah. But I think that's sort of why I like the pressure of being a cinematographer because there's always so many people relying on me that I don't let myself fail them, right? Right. There is, I care so much about not failing those people. Those people are showing up for us and those people are, especially in my department, showing up to help me and help me do my own best work. And, you know, if I'm showing up, screw their time, whatever. They don't need to know these things ahead of time. There's, there's here show up and help me do my job. Like if I just saw it that way, then I'd be the worst. Like I wouldn't want to work with me as a cinematographer, but I care so much about those people having a great experience and being in the know, you know, and I respect their time. Even if they're being paid, their time should also be respected. And I think that yep. is why it's so important to know. And that's why it's important to shoot with intent. Cause if we're just showing up on the day and saying, Bob, let's figure it out. Well, now nobody's prepared. The gaffer doesn't know what they should be pre-rigging. They don't know what they should be pre-lighting. They don't know what they should be having on standby. My ACs don't know where the equipment should be housed. They don't know what lenses I'm going to need next, you know? And I think that just creates all this confusion. I think it slows down the process and it makes things harder on them, you know? And at the end of the day, we end up staying later, right? If we didn't plan, we were adding so much time to our day. And instead of me saying, hey, I'm going to put in 20 hours of pre-production for this one day of shooting, so that we can have a clean 10 hour day guaranteed that to them matters so much more than me being brilliant, right? I could be the best image maker in the world, but if I make sure that their days are shit, if I make sure that their days are always longer than they need to be, if I always make sure that they are less appreciated than they need to be, then who cares? right? I'm not the greatest cinematographer, but one thing I can give them is the respect for their time. I can plan as much as humanly possible beforehand to respect everybody's time because that way we all show up and we know what we're doing. There's a vision we've created that I can articulate to everybody. And we all know we're on the same page. We're walking in on that day and we know what we're there to do. And I think everybody feels so much better about the day, about their experience, about being a part of this industry in general when we can give them at least that. Yeah, no, totally. I, um, that says a lot. There's just so many projects where like, (laughs) we didn't know what we were doing, you know? (laughs) And so having that mindset of like, I'm going to make this so much easier on everybody else. I'm like, just like, (laughs) listen to that. I'm like, all that was just like, 
off the shoulders <laughs> on a project that doesn't even exist yet. <laughs> right. And think about it as a director. Like if you know your cinematographer is doing that, like, again, I do, you know, people that work with me can testify. Like I do like full storyboards. I'll do like a full shot list down to the lens, the distance they are from the camera. I'll do the lighting diagrams beforehand and scouting photos, a lookbook. I'll send all of this stuff to my department, right? They're not even the creatives, they're the technicals, and I'm still going to give them all of this so they know what we're doing. They can be thinking about it in advance. And as a director, doesn't it make you feel better that you can show up on a set knowing all of that has been done, that everybody else knows what needs to be done, and that all you need to do is ensure that your story is being told? Yes. Does that not seem so much less stressful? Yes. Because like... <laughs> I know, um, I think like what a month ago we had a, ta- a table read for another project. And yeah. after that, you sent a little book of like what you were getting. I like, came just from other movies, right? And like, yeah. I told you, dude, that's exactly like what <laughs> I saw like right in the script. And like, just right. like how professional that document looked alone. Cause I mean, you could have done it half, half ass or whatever, you know, maybe you did, but like yeah. it looked so professional to the point where I'm like, <laughs> Dude, like we have to work with justice. <laughs> like, this is the right. thing that we have to do. <laughs> and that's the point. I don't do that so that people go, oh, he's so great. I want to work with him. I want to do it because I want them to see that they don't have to live in perpetual stress. They don't <laughs> have to live in this world of I have to know it all. I got to figure this out. What are we doing? Do we even all think we're on the same page here? Like, And then just hoping that you are, right? I can yeah. send you something. And that again, that was preliminary. That didn't even take me more than like 30, 40 minutes to just go, because honestly, it was just, all right, what am I seeing in my head when I see this? All right, let me find that thing. Let me find examples of this and compositions like this and put it all in the document, send it to them. Are you thinking something along the same lines? And if you go, yes, yes then great. And then <laughs> when you see that, you get to go, oh, thank God. It can be articulated. <laughs> what we're seeing in our heads can be articulated beforehand. We don't have to hope that on set we discover it. We can articulate it beforehand and know what we're going for. Exactly. Right? That's, that's what we as DPs should be giving to the director. That is what we should be doing. And I, and it bothers me. There's so many DPs, you know, that work in this smaller indie scale that don't have that consideration. And for me, I'm like, again, I don't care if you're the best image maker out there. There are plenty of cinematographers that can craft a way better image than I do that are even better at lighting than I am color grading. They have all of these things. They get to work with the Lexus and Supreme primes and all of these things. But like, again, the people I work with, like working with me and the directors I work with like working with me because I make their lives easier. And that is something that I feel like isn't given enough. That is such a core part of what our job is supposed to be. Have you, have you played or even heard of Cinetracer? Oh yeah. 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 I have not going to play that because I don't have the computer strong enough to use Cinetracer, but I, yeah, I've been following Matt Workman stuff for years now. So, so I bought it just to play with during quarantine. Mm-hmm. And it's 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 almost very um. I don't want to phrase it. It's taught me a lot. We'll put it that way because <laughs> it has different lights in there, and like yep. I mean, it tells you the distance and like mm-hmm. the lens length and like how far you are from like the subjects. I mean, it's great. Yeah, and you can uh, you can change. You know, you can go into like the RGB of like the sky panel you put in the scene, and you can yep. you know if you have the ray tracing, you can see like how the light bounces off like the ceramic tile and like what that does. Yeah, it's. It's way cool stuff, but sometimes I almost feel like while it's really cool and there's a project I'd love to do that on, sometimes you worry you're almost going to get too much in the weeds, you know, like there is, there is amount you should know. Absolutely. And I, but I think when you get to play with it beforehand like that, sometimes I think you almost over massage what you're going for because you just yeah. get to pick around at things and go, Hmm, Hmm, Hmm. Hey, that's kind of cool. But then in that moment, you have to remind yourself constantly or you'll lose track. Like, is this what I'm trying to do to tell the story? Right. Because it is so easy, especially with visuals to go, wow, that looks amazing. That looks super cool. Let's do that. But then forgetting, like, are we just doing things to be cool? Like, are we just doing things to look cool? Are we doing things to tell a story? Is this thing still trying to tell the story? you want to tell? And I think that's always just so important to keep in mind, because even for me, it's so easy to get in the weeds of like, oh, that would be so cool. I could put a light back here and I could get these rays coming down walls and I can throw like a medium amber on it and it'll be like this beautiful glowy sunset thingy and then you know i'll play some like really dramatically right here and the light will just like fall off the cheekbones but then again i gotta be like wait, wait, wait hold on but is that telling the story we're trying to tell because at the end of the day that's the only thing that matters that's the thing that's most paramount it's yeah. not what's gonna look coolest on the reel what's gonna look coolest in a frame grab on facebook it's gonna you know what is telling our story 
that's what we're here to do. So I think Santa Tracer is a lot of fun because you do get to see like what can go into a shot and how these things can affect a shot and, you know, try and get on this lens versus this lens in a very safe way. And I think that's great. I just yeah. don't want people to also get in the habit of like just looking for the cool thing and finding the cool, you know, three quarter with like the light and then throwing the backlight and be like, yeah, look at that. You know, yeah. you gotta remember. Because, Cause like, I mean that game, so I was, I was messing with it. Um, just, just to see like, Oh, you know, you could pre set up lights. Yep. And, I mean the best way for those who don't know, it's like a cinematography video game. Like that's the best way to describe yes. it. <laughs> yeah, basically. <laughs> I, I don't, I don't know how else to describe it, but, um, but like you, you, you know how to set up the lights and like, you know, like you said, as long as you're focusing on the shot and it's used for storyboarding. Yep. Uh, and you can get some really cool storyboard ideas out of that just mm-hmm. to get kind of get an yes. idea if it's going to flow well with your original idea. Right. Yep. And so as long as you keep that in mind with the budget, because I mean, you, dude, you could go like as many lights <laughs> as you want in the video game. You could throw um, like but, five M forties on cranes up in yeah. there and be like, wow, I can light this whole street. That's so cool. Here's my storyboard. And then they're yeah. like, okay, oh, but, we 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 have like five hundred dollars for our rental package, and one of those M forties, just the light itself, costs five hundred dollars a day to rent. So we're gonna need you to uh, get back in Cine Tracer and figure something else out. <laughs> yeah. So like, and I was playing with like light panels, and I'm like light panels are cheaper than all those fancy lights, right? And yep. but to see what you can actually pull off with just light panels alone, like it was kind of fun. Mm-hmm. Like, so yeah. it was kind of fun doing that with like a short script I wrote, just trying to like storyboard it, like. Maybe after yep. quarantine's over, you know, this will be all figured out. But <laughs> yes. uh, question for you then. Yeah. Since you're now shooting a new film, what's it like shooting pandemic mode? You know, it's, there's a lot you have to be, to be accountable for. And I think, again, going back to a cinematographer is somebody who has to be accountable and has to be integral. Um, you know, if, I, if I'm not an accountable, responsible, integral person, then I don't deserve to be in this job. I lead people in this right. job. Um, and so it is. It's a big consideration. And it was a little scary, you know, going into it. Because, you know, we made sure everybody was on a two-week quarantine beforehand. You know, everybody had to be tested. Everybody had to know, like, all right, nobody's been sick. Nobody's been around anybody that's been sick. Like, we are all clear. Everybody's checked out. And we had to actually replace our makeup artist like the night before because she ran sick and it wasn't necessarily that we knew it was coronavirus at the time, but we were not going to take a chance. No way in hell. So we had to, and we had, you know, procedures in place and we, you know, made people know like we have masks, we have hand sanitizing, making sure that we're wiping things down, you know, reminded everybody at lunch, right. You know, everybody needs to make sure that they're sanitized and everything and made sure that lunch was self-served so that it wasn't just like a giant bowl of something that everybody's reaching their hands and like it was individual things for people. Um, and you know, then keeping that in mind the whole time, you know, and some people wore masks the whole time, which was great. But, you know, as I said, we created an environment where we made sure everything was clean, where we were sterilized, there was access to things. And we were thinking about it beforehand. Again, just like anything else in cinematography and filmmaking, we were thinking about it beforehand. We didn't show up on set like, Hmm, how are we going to keep people safe? What are ways that we can prevent people from, you know, catching a deadly disease that may kill them or somebody they love? Like, <laughs> you can't be that blase about it and just show up on the day and be like, eh, let's figure it out. You know, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we yeah, thought about it. We had talked yeah. about it. We had made sure everybody was comfortable with it beforehand. And as I said, we'd established some things we were going to be doing and providing. Um, and again, if I, if I can't respect my, my crew's health, um, or their time, you know, what am I worth? Like, <laughs> I'm a D bag. Like, I'm a, I'm a total dirt bag if I don't care about those things or if I'm just like, ah, it's somebody else. Like, no, those are my people. Like, I, I am directly in charge of making sure that they are also cared for. So it was very important to us and we took a lot, a lot of precautions. Yeah. Cause I, I know that's been a discussion on the Utah filmmakers Facebook groups. Yep. Um, and I guess now there's like a certificate. Like a certified, yeah, you can get certified now, <laughs> for which is cool. COVID, yeah, that's really cool. <laughs> um, I just, do you think this is going to change the way we do things going forward? Oh yeah, no, absolutely. I think this is like, a, I think this event is one of those things that etches into our very fabric of our culture. Like when we think about people from the Great Depression or the Dust Bowl, like how those people that survived those things just had those things, like those little ticks they carried with them their whole life from having been through and survived that that were just innate in them, you know? And I think I've already seen it in myself, you know, like even when I, if I am anywhere near like six feet of a person out in public, I'm like real wary. <laughs> like I get real like anxious and it's not even, and it is because COVID happened, but at this point it's just like a reaction. 
Like if I'm just out in public, like if I'm on set, like I have a completely different mindset. I know how things have to work. And we've thought about every single person on that set and how we're accounting for them. But when you're just out in public, now I'm like at a grocery store, right? You know, we took my daughter to the zoo the other weekend, which was crazy. Um, but even then they had all these procedures and there were like maybe 150 people in the entire park and everybody had specific times, you know, and we made sure it was almost empty anyway, but we made sure we were distant from people. But there are times where people would walk like within six feet of us as they pass. And I was like, mm, mm, mm. like it's, <laughs> it, it really has, I think it's, it's going to be like a culture shock. I think it's going to be so in the, in little ticks that we may not even realize right away um, in, in who we are as people and how we go about our lives. And now for me, the concept of like going to Disneyland, like I think about it in a totally different way now than I thought about it before all of this. And I'm thinking about like, communal eating at like buffets and stuff like I think about that now and I'm like wow how do we how did we ever even do that in the first place <laughs> like <laughs> you almost like you almost retroactively your brain like goes through all of time and is like why did we ever do that to begin with like I don't know I've never been a huge handshaker either and so now I'm like yeah see I, why do we even handshake why do we why do all of our doors have handles we have to grab why why are there all these things that everybody has to touch all the time and it's supposedly supposed to be sanitary like i, I don't know yeah, this thing is just definitely you know made me look at all those things and go why did we ever do it that way in the first place like why, why was that ever safe it just took a, a pandemic that was just much more susceptible to catch on to make us realize it you know like countries like japan have always been wary of things like this and they they do a lot on this front way before coronavirus to you know mitigate sickness and public sanitation and everything and you know people are like ah, oh, the japanese are weird they don't shake they bow you know and you're like well part of that is cultural but also they're not touching people as often as we are you know and that is partially a cultural awareness of disease because it's a highly densely populated country and they know that and people there wear masks Sometimes just every day, just because they never know if people around them are sick. And they've been doing that forever. Like, so it's funny to see how, how, you know, we look at other parts of the world before and went like, man, those guys are kind of crazy. And now we're looking at ourselves like, wow, why did we ever do this stuff to begin with? Like, why, what was our thinking there? It is, Dude. it's crazy. It's, it's something I don't think is going to go away. We're going to be those old people like Cloroxing after every scoop at the buffet because we're going to be like, somebody else touched this. Somebody else touched this. That's gross. That's weird. I'm not comfortable with that. Somebody else could have been sick. And we're going to be like 78 year old people at the buffet doing that. And their grandkids are going to be looking at us like, what's wrong with you? Why do you like that? <laughs> Dude. It's just like, so I was a janitor for four years uh -huh. and uh, at the company I work for now, actually, but uh, discussion has been like, are people going to go back in the office? You know? Mm -hmm. And I'm like, I wouldn't trust that. <laughs> like I know <laughs> how unsanitary people are after yep. cleaning up for them. Like I'm like, mm -mm, people are gross. Like I, uh -uh. Yep. and it is, <laughs> I mean, it's a comfort thing, right? Cause yeah, I it's, like, I'm it, back in our office and, but it's, we are on a schedule, you know, and I'm like one yeah. of three people that's in the office and we're all sitting far away from each other. And the company has cleaning stations literally like every 30 feet. There's a bucket with hand sanitizer. There's a bucket with Clorox wipes. There's a bucket with paper towels. There's tissues at everybody's desk. They have two cleaning staffs now that regularly come clean four times a day. And so that even with only the three of us, that was the only way I felt comfortable going back. But in, if, as you said, when you see the other side of it, when you actually are in charge of like cleaning and sanitation, like I can imagine you, there are some places where you'd be like, mm -mm, no matter what I do, these people are not, I would not go around these people. <laughs> I just would not. <laughs> no, dude. I'm no, it's, it's so disgusting. I, and like, it's even watching movies now with people like, like I, I recently watched uh, the dark Knight rises. Mm -hmm. There's a huge riot scene and fight sequence at the end, right? And what? I'm like, dude, they're not six feet apart. <laughs> <laughs> I know. It's that secondhand anxiety now. I do the same thing. Like when I see crowds in movies, like I'm trying to think of what the last movie I watched. It was, oh yeah, we watched Murder, Murder on the Orient Express the other night. And I was thinking like all those people in that train <laughs> and they were constantly like in each other's faces and like grabbing each other's handkerchiefs and like all this stuff. And I was like, like I was still watching the movie, but I, in the back of my brain, there were gears turning like, Ugh, that's ew, don't do that. <laughs> They're gross. You're all going to get sick. You're all trapped in this metal cage. In there. <laughs> yeah. And like, I, I think it was, um, I want to say it was Batman returns. I watched, I watched that last night, but mm -hmm. there, there's a scene where he's drinking from water and somebody yeah. else drinks from the water. And <laughs> I was just like, like the same cup. Right. I'm like, yeah, no, no, <laughs> no.
And the, not neither that. am I sniffing other now. You know, it's like, no, <laughs> like get your own cup. Yeah. Yeah. There are rules. Okay. We have things we have to adhere to. Okay. We're not <laughs> savages. Get your own cup. <laughs> My cup. Oh, it's so true, though. <laughs> uh, it's going to change things. I'm, I just thought I, I'd ask you because I have. I have not stepped foot out of my apartment for films, anything film related since this whole thing hit. So it's right. kind of interesting to hear the other side. Yes. And it was very interesting. And, you know, we postponed it. We'd kicked it down the road a couple of times. Like our shoot was, I think originally supposed to be the last week of March, first week of April. And we pushed it back. You know, we pushed it back almost a full month and a half. Cause we were like, all right, we're not sure if the conditions are good yet. We don't know if we've put everything in place that we need to, to feel safe about yeah. going up the set and that the locations we have are going to be safe and sanitary. So it took us a while to make sure we had that before we did. So we did, we moved the shoot a couple of times until we knew we had that. And so it is, it is scary a little bit, you know, but it felt less scary. I think because I know all of the thought the preparation and consideration that had gone into it before we'd walked on set. And so I felt, I felt good on set and I felt comfortable with everybody on set, you know, and it's been over a month since that shoot and nothing happened. So I, we, I guess we did it right, but you know, I understand that it it can be very scary. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, how do you feel about movie theaters opening back up? <sighs> oh, this is a fun one because it's hard for me because I like my first job when I was 16 was working in a movie theater. I worked at the uh, megaplex of the district. Um, and I worked there for two years. I worked there all through high school. Um, you know, and I saw so many movies, you know, like the, the theater experience to me is such a big part of, you know, of my loves. Like if I, if I have a choice of something fun to go do, I want to go to the movies. Like I love going to the movies. It's, right. I'll go, I've gone by myself so many times just cause for me, it's almost spiritual, you know, and it, and it almost sounds silly to say it, you know, but I think people who, who feel the same way totally get what I'm getting at here. It is also just something spiritual about it for you. Super relaxing. Just sit in the back. Nobody's bugging you. Like, yeah, it's cathartic. Like you, you know, that's almost like an emotional cleanse, like whatever I'm going through in life, if I'm going to go to a movie theater. By the time I leave the movie theater, whatever it was, I've forgotten about it. It's, yep. it didn't, it didn't matter. I feel good. I feel like you walk out almost feeling like you had a huge, you know, like, deep breath you know like it, it is like it's the equivalent of that like almost a spiritual equivalent of like a deep breath you walk out of the theater and i always feel so refreshed and i you know i've never felt bad about going to a movie like you know there have been movies i didn't like in theaters obviously but even movies i didn't like in theaters i still walk out of the theaters feeling good because i went and saw a movie and so for me this is a hard one because movie theaters are one of the higher things that you are definitely putting people at risk for just by nature of theaters being so communal and so close um, and so I haven't gone, um, and it's and not like there's really anything playing right now anyway, <laughs> otherwise, but you know, I do miss it for sure, but I totally get why we haven't done it. Um, and there's, I, I haven't found a reason to justify it yet, you know, cause there isn't a justification, you know, they're like playing the Hobbit movies right now. I think at the, the local Cinemarks or something or, and you know, I'm like, well, that would be cool. You know, I never got to see those in theater. I was like three when those came out, you know, or not three. I was like eight when those came out. So I never really got to see them in theaters like that. But I was like, it's just not worth it. You know, it's just not. Yes, it's really important, and I love it, and I miss it so much. But really, there are so many other things worth potentially sacrificing my life over. And going to movies is just not one of those things right now. <laughs> I agree. I, it, it was weird because, like, I know in January and February. February Yep. Before like it hit the US. Um, I mean Sundance just happened, uh all these trailers for like tenant, you know, like we actually got like more of a finalized trailer, just like what? what? Mm -hmm. You know, like this is gonna be it. And now yeah. that's pushed back, which is good. I'm not saying that's bad. I, I think that's good yeah. because I Absolutely. and people are like, We'll just release that on VOD. I'm like, you don't understand, like some no. movies you have to see in theater to get the yes. whole experience. Like you have Absolutely. to like uh, like it, Interstellar and Arrival are great examples of like some of my favorite experiences. Even Mission Impossible Six. I don't know if you've mm -hmm. seen that movie, but like yeah. that was I saw that like three times in IMAX just because it was so fun, exhilarating. Right. Like Dunkirk these bigger movies me. need it. Yeah, see, that was a great one for an IMAX experience. That movie's so sensory. Uh, yeah. I know, and Tenet is exactly that way, and that's why I feel the same way. I'm like you know, I hate it, man, but keep kicking it down the road because yeah. that's a movie we're gonna have to experience in theater. I'm not, I'm not gonna watch that on my 40 inch screen, laying in bed one night, like thinking I'm gonna get anywhere close to the same experience. Like, no, that's not gonna happen. Absolutely. 
Dude, yeah. If like, so Tenet and Dune were going to be my religious movies this year. Right. And I feel like they just got pissed on by a virus. <laughs> yeah, they did. They absolutely. You know, I was really excited about the new James Bond movie too, No Time to Die. Yes. That was yeah, supposed yeah. to come out in April. Because I've always loved those movies since I was a kid. And I always have a close love of seeing those movies in theaters. And so I, I was super bummed that that one got kicked down the road because I was also super excited about that. But again, like keep kicking it down the road, whatever. Yeah. I know it's hard and it's probably costing you money to kick it down the road. And I know it's rough, but like this is the, the experience people deserve for these movies is going to be in a theater. And when we can figure out how to safely all kind of find a way back to the theater, then that's when it should happen, but not a moment before. But it's I I feel like I'm the the first time I go in the theater knowing that I'm safe and everybody else is safe right like I'm gonna cry yeah. <laughs> like, it, it it's gonna be like, such a great experience and <laughs> it's like a movie like like a big blockbuster like that you know has to be there for all of us to like go and enjoy like we survived you know like right like I don't know it's almost been so long I've kind of almost forgotten that feeling you get. You know, when you see the lights drop and then you see like, you can see the screen part and now you see like, you know, you like feel the bass when that first, you know, ad or whatever or a trailer comes on and you feel that, you know, and you can just feel yourself settling into your seat. Your eyes are just glued. Your hand is almost like mechanically without thought, just like popcorn melt, popcorn melt, popcorn melt. You know, you think about it, you know, that I, I almost can't even remember. I can't even recall necessarily what that feels like. Cause it's been so many months. Cause I think I went and saw 1917 in theaters at the beginning of January, I want to say. And I don't think I've been since. So it's been like half a year. So I'm like, yes, get me back in there. I'm probably going to cry too, but not until it's a good time. Yeah. The, the last movie I saw in theater, dude, this would be a, like a good question. Is like, what was the last movie you saw in theater? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> pre right. COVID. Um, the last one I saw was uh, The Way Back with Ben uh, Affleck. Uh, I cried in that one. It was a really good movie, but hmm. it, was, it wasn't anything like worth like, you know, like you don't have to see that one in a theater. Like, right. that's one of those ones you could easily watch on your TV. But I think yeah. the last big blockbuster before that was like 1917, probably with my parents. Mm-hmm. Right. Or Star Wars. I saw that a lot too. <laughs> yeah, I know. Me too. So, but it's been, it's been a minute. It's, I, you know, it's funny until you said that I hadn't even really consciously connected when I had last been in a theater, but yeah, it has, it has been since early January. So now it's almost been, it's almost been seven months since we're coming up on early July soon. (laughs) Oh man. (laughs) It makes me sad. It really does. Have you seen anything worth watching? Well, and while I've been at home pandemic mode. Yeah. Oh yeah. I feel like I watched a ton. So I'm, because I'm a dad, I feel like I, um, I watch so fewer movies than most people do. Like it's, I track, like I have, I make a list. Not only do I have a, whatever it's called, the one that we're on the, um, the, the app thing, social media thing for logging your movies. A oh, letterbox letterbox. That's what, okay. Not sponsored, uh, not, but great app. <laughs> yes. Great app. Um, not only do I have letterbox, but I've also, I also have like a Google doc where I track all the movies I watch. Um, okay. And, you know, and I'm part of like these movie watching groups of people and they're like at the end of the month, like how many movies you watch this month? And people are like 57 or like 73 Dear or Lord. like 38. <laughs> and I'm like, and some people are like, I watched one a day. I watched 30 movies this month. And I look back at my total and sometimes it's like one or two movies. There have been months where it was zero. Movies. <laughs> so because of just by nature of being a dad and having this busy life, um, I haven't watched as many, but I have, there was like a good spree. I don't know what it was about April. I watched like seven or eight movies. Um, and I finally got around that month watching knives out and Jojo rabbit. Um, I feel like there was one more in there that I was thinking and midway parrot. Well, no, I haven't watched that one. That was on my list though. I just keep trying to convince my wife that we need to watch it. And she's like, I just gotta be in the mood. I'm like, I get that, but I'm in it. So (laughs) (laughs) just find a way to get in that headspace so we can watch this movie. Cause even my mom, who's not a movie person at all, watched it on like a plane. She's like, that was pretty good. I think you'd like it. I was like, wow, for my mom to say that, that must've been a pretty damn good movie. Cause my mom thinks everything (laughs) I like is weird. So (laughs) Um, yeah. So yeah, I watched Jojo. I watched Nice Out. We watched Midway. We watched The Invisible Man. Um, as I said, we watched Murder on the Orient Express the other night. Um, 13th, great documentary, amazing documentary. Um, yeah, there's probably, I'm sure there's a bunch I'm missing, but um, 
Yeah, I was so glad because I didn't get to see a lot of those movies in theaters. And I was really kind of bummed out just because, as I said, by nature of having a daughter and having a busy life, you know, there were, I had to be very particular about if I was going to go to the movies, it had to be like once every couple of months and it had to be something I really wanted to see. It was a battle I had to pick, you know, so um, that battle was 1917 and I picked that. So I finally got to watch Knives Out and Jojo Rabbit, which I was, were two movies I really had wanted to see. Um, and I was so glad that I got to watch them. And I loved those. Both of those movies were amazing. Oh man, Knives Out might have probably my favorite ending of all time of a movie. Like that last scene at the very end and they're standing on the balcony with that cup. I was like, what? Oh, it was like, I could not help myself but like grinning ear to ear and standing up being like, yes! Like, ah, that's amazing. Oh, I love, oh, the ending of that movie is amazing. <laughs> and so, like, I, I really like Ryan Johnson. Yeah. Um, He's, he's, he's uh, to me, like, I, I know there's like a lot of controversy in Star Wars fandom because of The Last Jedi. <laughs> Star Wars fans are the worst. Yes, they are. Um, but the, <laughs> I happen to love that movie. But me too. The, the, what's funny about that movie is about Knives Out is like all these Star Wars fans are like, it's Ryan Johnson. He can't write, he can't direct. And I'm like, dude, this is an original <laughs> story that he just fucking like slammed right in your faces. And it's great. Like, there's oh, like, it's so good. And like his, oh. I, if you ever get the chance, um, I'd recommend wa- or listening to his commentary uh, on uh, the DVD because, like, it's oh cool, yeah, dude. He he's very knowledgeable. But I almost picked him for there's a thing Patrick and I are doing. I think he's releasing today, so I'll talk about it because this, this is going to be Friday. But it's called uh, Pitch Slap, where we talk about pitching about Batman Beyond, like who's going to be Bruce Wayne and who's going to be you know right. the new Batman. <laughs> and I my first pick to be the director was Ryan Johnson. And then I'm like, mm. no, that, that's going to be a lot of weird fandom there. <laughs> like, yeah. But I, I settled with Chad Stilisky, who did John Wick 4, like yeah. all the John Wick movies, yeah. essentially. Mm-hmm. Like, yeah, I was just talking about him the other day to a coworker, actually. <laughs> oh, yeah? <laughs> yeah, because we were just, I don't remember what we were talking about specifically, but we ended up talking about the John Wick movies. And he's like, who directed those? I was like, actually, let me, uh, let me show you. This guy's got a million stunt credits. And that's why he was mm. perfect man for the job. <laughs> Seriously, like if you want, dude, if you want like a fight movie that's like hands on, like mm-hmm. Chad Stilisky, there is a, I think it's a, ta- uh, what kind of film was it? I don't remember what country it's from. Indonesia. It was Indonesia. Oh, the raid? No, it's similar to The Raid. It's called The Night Comes For Us, or I think that's what it's called. It's on Netflix. So it's, it's yeah, I'm like, the, <laughs> yeah, no, it's like The Raid where it's like, you know, hand to hand combat, but it's a lot more brutal. Uh huh. And like, I mean, there's a scene where somebody like slams this dude's head out out a window, right? Mm-hmm. And he drags his whole like head across the window pane where there's, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And oh. dude, it's just like brutal, like fuck. But like that kind of combat, like that, I mean, that takes like a lot of style and like a lot of patience to like choreograph and no homework. Yeah. That's a lot of homework. But <laughs> but um, Ryan Johnson, <laughs> well, Ryan Ryan Johnson, though, I, I, I think. Oh, dude, just names out. I loved it, and I think he's he's a good director. And Looper was one of my favorite sci fi's in yeah, 2010. I remember so, I watched that. That one came out when I worked at the theaters, and I remember I went and saw that one, and I was really happy because not as many people went and saw it, which is weird. I know it was I, weird. And like Joseph Gordon Levitt was like big star power at that time, but yeah, and yeah. He, he, he looked like Edward Norton in that movie. Like when I saw <laughs> yeah. the trailer, I'm like, is that Edward Norton or like Joseph Gordon Levitt? I'm like, what? <laughs> <laughs> but there's Joseph Gordon Levitt supposed to be looking a little bit like uh, like uh, Bruce Willis. There we go. I was like, what's his last name again? Bruce Wayne. No. <laughs> <laughs> um. <laughs> but also JoJo because I loved JoJo too. I was so glad. I really wanted to see that because I love Taika. I think Taika's an amazing director, and so I was super excited about JoJo because it's also right up my alley, historical. And it was a comedy and it was a great director and I was super excited. And I, yeah, I finally, like a lot of these movies, I just finally go out and buy on Blu-ray. I'm like, screw it. I'm going to own it. That way there's way more incentive for me to watch it. Cause I just paid 20 bucks for it. Yeah. So I loved that one too. That one was so much fun for me. Um, and I cried during that one as well, but you know, both great movies, but I, as I said, there's so many movies I'm still trying to catch up on like parasite. And you know, I still want to see Ford v Ferrari. That's um, on HBO. If you have HBO. I apparently with at and I get 30 days free. I think I got the text the other day, so I probably should, but um, yeah, there's still lots and you know, every now and then we'll find the time to sit down and commit ourselves. Cause our baby Gemma goes to bed around eight o'clock. So then it's like, all right, are we still 
awake enough after eight o'clock to sit through two, two and a half hours of the movie. More often, no, but every now and then we'll get in. We watched Midway, funny enough, I, which I still laugh that we even picked Midway to watch because that's, I don't want to say it's a bad movie because I don't think it's technically a bad movie. It's probably a great movie to a lot of people, but because of my fascination with history and my love of war films particularly, I don't know. I was like, all right, this is like, um, this is like Dances with Wolves. This is like, this is like The Patriot. But it's like uh, it's World War Two, and it was made with modern, awesome technology. It's just another one of those like feel good America overcoming and wow, we're great, the saviors of liberty kind of movies. <laughs> it's like yeah, it was, it was a fun watch, but I wouldn't say it's a great movie. <laughs> yeah, that's actually why I didn't watch Hacksaw Ridge for the longest time. Yeah, like, I know no- I put that one off too for a while because I feel like it's that same kind of genre. <laughs> yeah, and Mel Gibson is. You know, a controversial uh, yeah. guy. But yeah, even I finally, I finally watched it, dude, and I'm like, this is not a feel-good movie at all. This is <laughs> it's a brutal war film. <laughs> but I should oh, watch. Man. You should. Um, okay, well, let's kind of wrap this up so we can get on with our, our Saturdays. Uh, okay. One, pe- what's one piece of advice that stuck to you throughout the years? This is a great question. I have. I have a lot and I think I've, I've been blessed to have a lot of great people in my life who have helped me out. There's a a great man and I always, always quote him and he's probably sick of it by now, but shout out to you Laird. Um, He, when he was the one who really turned me on to cinematography as a a career form and as a true art and the reason why I started diving back into it. Um, And the thing that he told me that's always stuck with me and it's not quite verbatim, but it was basically you're only as good as what you can guarantee. Um, you know, you're only as good as what you can guarantee. Um, and I think that's really kind of the ethos of, of what we have to do as technical artisans, right. As, as filmmakers, you know, I am only as good as what I can guarantee as a cinematographer, you know, in quality. Can I, can I get above it of what I can guarantee? Sure. But the goal is that there should be a minimum that you know, you can get from me when you work with me, there should be a bare minimum of what that is. And the higher that bare minimum is, the better I am, obviously. But the point is that there is a threshold where you go, all right, if I work with him, I know at the very least, this is what I'm going to get. Quality wise, professional wise, in terms of participation, in terms of what they bring to the table, this is the bare minimum that I know I will get from them. This is their guarantee level, right? And we're really only as good as what that level is. If you're somebody who has super high highs and super low lows, right? If you're all over the board, if you sometimes make amazing things and some things you make just aren't great, it, it's so much harder to convince somebody that you're a great pick, right? It's hard because what can you guarantee? What of you am I going to get on this project? Am I going to get the one who the high high or am I going to get you at a low low? You know, and it's, it's just volatile. And especially when you work professionally, like right in the industry, um, you know, you have to be consistent. They're not hiring inconsistent people to be key grips or dolly grips or, you know, like uh, best boy electricians. Like they're not, they're not hiring people who don't have that level of consistency in the quality of work they do. So I always tell people that it's so important to know who you are and what you can guarantee because that is, you're only as good as that thing. Right. And, and based on me, cause I get to hire people based on directors who hire me, you know, they're all looking for the same thing. If I'm going to hire this person, what am I going to get out of it? And they want to know. They want to know what they're going to get. And they need to know based on your previous work and who you are as a person that they can look at you and go, I know what I'm going to get. You know, and I think that's so important. And so many people neglect that. And, you know, there are ways. You have to be honest with yourself. And that's something that I think is the hardest part about what you can guarantee. You have to be honest and you have to look at yourself and say, I don't know as much about this. I don't understand this as well. You know, I struggle with executing this and that holds me back from reaching this level of a guarantee. Identify those things and fix those things. Make those improvements. Go learn those things. As we talked about, the second biggest piece of advice I'd have is don't be scared to not know things, right? And those two things are directly correlated. Don't be scared to say, I don't know this. But the biggest part of that is following it up with, but I'm going to find out. That is where the magic is, is saying, this is what I can guarantee. This is what I don't know that I am willing to go and learn to make sure that I can now guarantee this in my work. 
And then when I go learn these new things, guarantee this. And after these experiences, I'll be able to guarantee this, right? And it goes higher and higher. And that's how you get to that place, right? That everybody talks about wanting to be at. That's how you yeah. find yourself at the head of a 230 person crew on a $90 million movie is by continually setting a new guarantee for your quality and finding ways over and over again to increase the quality that you can guarantee in your work. That's what it comes down to and being honest with yourself about what you don't know and being comfortable not knowing it and being comfortable asking for information on how to learn those things. And that's Justice's TED Talk. <laughs> <laughs> There's the applause right there. Yay! Yeah, we'll insert it in. <laughs> um, oh, cool, man. I, I think that's a really cool insight and outlook. You have a lot of, you have a lot of positivity to your character and to your craft. And I really appreciate that. Well, thank you. It's, um, I know it's not easy, but I think that's, it's the same thing with cinematography and the same thing with positivity. If it were easy, why, what would be the point? Right. <laughs> Everything takes effort and the things you put in effort into are the things that are going to give you the most return. Right. I get that. Do you quit? Is it freezing? All right. Is it freezing? Thank no. you, everybody. Is it freezing? <laughs> oh, oh, no, there you go. You're back. I'm You're back? back. Oh, dear God. I was trying okay. to do a good sign up just in case. <laughs> okay, what's, what's in this then before my internet takes another shit? Because this has been awful. <laughs> um, not the internet, not this. You've been great. Uh, where can people find you? What, what, what have you got going on? Uh, you can find me on Instagram at DP Justice Page. Um, you can find me on Facebook, Justice Page. Uh, I have a website. Uh, I'm trying to remember it off the top of my head. I think it's justicepage.myportfolio.com. You can find the links to my uh, portfolio on all of my social medias. Um, uh, you just reach out, honestly. Again, I, I actively mentor. I have a lot of mentees. So I can, can testify that I'm not very scary. I'm a great guy to go to for questions. So don't be hesitant. Reach out and let's just chat. Nice. Dude, <laughs> thank you so much for coming on. Absolutely. Had a hell of a time. <laughs> <laughs> and thank you for being patient with me. I, I should say thank you for being patient with my internet issues. That's my job. That's like the worst thing ever. How do I even? Oh, okay, cool. Um, anyways, yeah, you can find the podcast everywhere. The videos will be up on YouTube and Facebook. And you can follow me on Instagram and Twitter along with the podcast itself. I don't promote myself on Facebook because I don't like Facebook. <laughs> fair enough i don't know i'm like i all use that for creatives in the industry but i don't know <laughs> i i don't know i'm weird on it okay anyway um justice thank you thank you for having me <laughs>